Thank you so much for that warm welcome. And I just want to say it is really um, a nice thing to see for me personally because I, I am really into blended learning and really believe it. To see a university this size put as much um, effort and resources in providing to you um, the tools that you need to be able to successfully blend your courses. Just um, by show of hands, how many of you in here are already teaching blended courses? Okay, so you know, several of you already are. So this is gonna be old hat to you. Um, I wanna make this very interactive, so at any time if you have a question um, and I don't see you, just say, I have a question. Um, because sometimes I don't notice someone's hand is up. Otherwise, I'll be breaking at points in the presentation uh, and asking if there are any questions or comments. And at the end, I understand we'll have a, a bit of time for discussion and questions as well. Um, I want to thank you for inviting me here today. It truly is a privilege to be here. I love Canada more than any other place other than home, and I truly mean that. I have not been to a bad place in Canada, and I've been here all the way up to, you know, fishing about, you know, 500 miles north of Thunder Bay to, you know, Vancouver, which uh, is my most favorite city in the world that I've been to, uh, Edmonton, here, so um, no part of Canada has been bad for me. Quebec City, delightful. So with that being said, what I've been asked to do today is to share some of my experiences with blended learning. And I'm going to do that, and I thought about it because I've had, by now, I've taught well over 100 blended classes, but I didn't only want to talk about classes that I teach. I wanted to talk about classes that, through my observation and interaction with students, have been particularly meaningful to them. And I recognized as I started thinking about that that um, most of, that all of those classes really were a great example of high impact practices. How many of you are familiar with high impact practices when I use that terminology? Okay, not so much. So, so um, and that's okay. So because what we're going to do, this is the boring stuff. Logistically, we're going to talk a little bit about common language so that when I'm saying something, you know what I'm referring to. And so we'll talk about um, blended uh, and hybrid, both terms are used by the way, blended hybrid teaching and learning, experiential learning, high impact educational practices. Then we'll demonstrate um, four cases, which are really four classes that were taught in a blended format where high impact practices, including experiential learning, because that is a part of high impact learning, um, were applied to solve a teaching and learning problem. Um, and then um, a graduate assistant and myself did a study on two of the classes. And so I want to share, and that study's been published, but I want to share just a few of the findings with you today um, as related to those two blended classes. So we'll get started. Blended courses, they're designed to enhance learning by including a planned amount of structured activities outside of the classroom. And I want to be sure to emphasize the word structured because if I teach a graduate a course and assign 250 pages to read for a week and students do that outside of the classroom, that's not really what I would refer to as structured learning. Okay. However, if I assign that reading and then ask those students to get online into the class site and discuss elements of that reading prior to coming cl to class, and I gave them a due date to do that and some very specific guidelines to do that, that's what I would consider structured learning outside of the classroom. It involves generally extensive course redesign um, when the course was previously taught either online or totally online, I'm talking about, or face-to-face. -face. Um, it has many different formats and schedules, even, even for the same teacher. For instance, I teach quantitative research, okay? Not of a very popular topic for students in the US. I don't know if it is here or not. But um, I would never teach that class in an abbreviated six-week format, for instance, over the summer, because I would go crazy and the students would probably go crazy too, but what's most important is they wouldn't absorb it, they wouldn't learn it. 
So, you know, that's just one of the things that you need to consider when you're teaching, you know, whether that be in any f f mode of delivery. You know, what are your time constraints? What, what can you teach in that, um, it, with those constraints? Um, most blended courses, I should say, blended courses do use technology to enhance learning, and they generally employ high impact learning practices, including experiential learning. So blended learning um, really places the responsibility of learning, the primary responsibility with the student. And you know how we sometimes get dinged on, on um, our course evalu evaluations and we remember those dings. So I'm gonna share a ding with you that I think really um, highlights this particular point. I was teaching statistics and I looked at the course evals and one of the students said on the course evaluation, if I don't know what statistical significance is, it, it's because Dr. Caulfield didn't make me understand it. And I always kind of laugh at that when I think about it because the bottom line is, is you can only do so, so much. But at some point, the student has to say, you know what, this is important and I'm gonna learn it and I'm going to do whatever I need to do, whether that means go make an appointment with Dr. Caulfield or whatever, but I've gotta get this concept down. So um, in a blended learning environment, students really need to do that because it's very active. It would be very difficult to structure or design a blended course out, out with learning activities structured outside of the classroom without it being an active learning experience. So then the primary responsibility of the teacher is one of creating engaging learning experiences that meet the student learning objectives. So blended learning then is really a joint and provocative exploration of the discipline being taught. And it's done with both the teacher and learner involved. And the role of the teacher and learner sometimes is pretty fluid. I tell students at the beginning of my class that I'm probably going to learn as much from them and their life experiences than what I can help them learn during the course of a semester. And I believe that to be very true. Now, I'm going to say something. That blended is very much, very much complements my teaching and learning style. For people who are really entertain entertainers and engaging lecturers, which I am not, okay, but for people who are, all right, this means you really have to rethink how you teach. And in my experience in working with lots of faculty who want to teach blended, and those faculty who are really, really good lecturers, it's hard for, harder for them to make this adjustment. So um, you need to think about that a bit if you are one of those people. But once it's done, it can, be very, it, it can very successfully be done. Okay, blended teaching and learning increases the opportunity of multiple forms of ongoing interaction. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Anderson and his um, theory regarding um, interaction and learning. And that's really where I'm coming from when I say this. Basically, Anderson says, you know what? Interaction can occur, can occur in a number of ways. It can occur student with student. We see a lot of that in blended learning because students are interacting with one another online. They may be interacting with each other if they're meeting outside of the class. Um, so they, and they can really do this um, any place. Um, online asynchronously, in other words, not real time, um, or real time, synchronously, they can interact with the content, multimedia content, anywhere there's a Wi-Fi connection. They can interact with the teacher, face-to-face -face or online, and they certainly can interact with the community, face-to-face -face or online, and they can interact with their environment. So, Blended learning increases the number of ways for interaction to occur. And according to, inter according to Anderson, interaction is how we learn. I mean, it's a form of constructivist learning. So it provides that opportunity. Okay, now, high impact educational practices. Whenever you see something in italics, it's a direct quote. Um, and so um, this is based on the work of G.D. Koo and he has probably done more work and research in the area of high impact educational practices than anyone I've come across. And I think I would ask you to look at these carefully because as we review 
the course examples, I hope that you begin to see how these cases, these four cases of classes, really fit these high impact practices. So they demand that students devote considerable time and effort to meaningful work, okay? Not meaningful from my perception. Of course, if I'm the teacher and creating it, I always think it's meaningful. But meaningful from their perspective. And there's an art to that. There's an art to being able to get students to understand why it is you are asking them to do the things that you're asking them to do. Build it, its high impact practices, build substantive relationships with faculty and with peers through, again, that interaction, that discussion regarding shared intellectual interests. They provide students with rich and frequent feedback, not only feedback on the work that they submit, but feedback as they're doing it in the classroom, in the community, um, from experts that they may, that they may be interacting with. Um, it helps students apply and test what they're learning, not only in the classroom, but outside of the classroom as well. And it provides opportunities, and this is so important because for me personally, this is the essence of why I'm an educator. Um, this is the essence of education. Provides opportunities for students to reflect on the person they are becoming, resulting in a deeper understanding of self in relationship to others, the larger world, while at the same time building the intellectual skills and ethical grounding to act with confidence to make the world a better place. Isn't that what we all want? I mean, isn't that really the goal of education? So, having said that, the examples. Um, oh, I wanna give some examples of high impact educational practices, and there are many others. So common intellectual experiences, like in the states, and I'm not sure that you have this here, but I guess you, you do, but you might call it something else. We have core curriculum. In other words, there are classes that everyone seeking a certain degree must take. So you know that would be an example of a common intellectual experience. Collaborative assignments and projects. Collaborative research, I did um, a collaborative research last year and which resulted in a publication with a couple of people from Canada, a couple of people from the UK, and one other person from the United States. It was fun, it was so much fun. And you know, we did this, we got together once face to face for a day, but the rest of the time we interacted online, most of the time asynchronously, but sometimes we got on Skype. Um, and it was a great collaborative experience. Community-based learning, diversity, global learning, where we learn about other cultures, where we learn about global problems, and we work together as to how to best um, reach solutions or, or, make, or, or um, solve those problems, and then capstone projects. So those are just some examples of what would be considered high-impact educational practices. Experiential learning a part of high impact practices. I put up a, def a couple of definitions here. Kolb is probably, uh, he's the one that coined the term um, many years ago, um, but I personally like Fenwick, who happens to be Canadian if you don't know her. Um, um, Fenwick's definition, an independent learner cognitively reflecting on concrete experience to construct new understandings, really constructivist view perhaps with the assistance of an educator, but remember when you're out in the community, the educator may not, might not be with you, probably isn't, but yet you have that educator's guidance. Um, you can come back and talk with the educator um, and towards some social goal of progress or improvement. So, before we go on to the cases, I wanna know, do you have any comments to share regarding what has been shared with you or any questions? Yes. <laughs> like Oprah. <laughs> Uh, it's just a technical question. There are many references and uh, citations and websites on the PowerPoint. Um, are you going to share the PowerPoint maybe in a PDF or? Absolutely, I'd be happy to do much. that. In fact, um, David already has it, and I, but I, I can put it in PDF format as well, and there is a less list of references at the conclusion. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. You bet. 
Anyone else? Okay, then we will move on and talk about these examples. The first is creating community art. And it was taught by a professor in fine arts, no surprise there. Um, understanding urban homelessness taught by a cultural anthropologist. Um, a sustainable lifestyles taught by uh, a professor in education uh, who happens to be very into environmental concerns. And then leading in diverse and complex environments, which was taught by me. Um, and so let's go forward. So remember I said that approaching blended in a way of thinking, okay, how can blended help me engage students in learning these outcomes? Um, I started each of these examples with a question. And the question, by the way, didn't come from me, except for the last question, because I taught that course and continue to teach that course. But the question came from the individual teaching the course. So Dr. Lackey asked herself, how do we, or excuse me, um, Dr. Mangridge asked herself, how do we create art that best reflects a community's culture? She personally always wanted to be able to have students do this, okay? But she just didn't understand how she could really make it come alive with having students sit in the classroom. So she decided that she, this was her first blended learning experience, and she decided that she was gonna do something that she had dreamt about doing and was very passionate about. So she wanted to create this piece of, or she wanted students to create this piece of community art. She titled the course Site in the Public Space. It was an upper level undergraduate course. Um, students majored in visual art, architecture, and urban planning. There were 15 students in the course, and one third of the time was spent online, doing online discussion planning. Um, and one third was spent in the classroom, and one third was spent in the community. Okay, the first thing that the students needed to do was decide where they wanted to place the art, okay? And so they had a, a number of discussions, face-to-face -face and continued online, um, where they discussed the ideation of what they were going to do, and they came up with um, this site. Uh, and so this is where they ended up, as you will see um, at the conclusion, where they ended up putting their um, art. Okay, I gave you this visual representation, and I'm not sure you can see it real well, but, um, and, and this was done actually by Amy Mangridge, um, and where she actually plotted out, because it was, she's a visual learner, and it was important to her to plot out how she was going to do this blended class. And so for those of you who are, this might help you. So her face-to-face, -face, she considered face-to-face -face both outside of the class and in the class. So the students first um, met outside of the class to do the ideation. And remember, they decided on that um, particular uh, place that I showed you. Then they continued that discussion online. Then they um, also concluded it in the classroom, face-to-face, -face, okay? And then they started preparing the proposal because they had to submit a proposal to the art board to get the approval of the art board to be able to place this art. So not only were they learning about art, but they were learning about the process that you need to go through when you want to display art in a public place. So they did the proposal, then um, they started it in the classroom, they finished it in small groups online, um, or I should say they continued it, and then they finished it in the face-to-face -face classroom. And then they started planning interviews with the community because what they discovered as they talked about this community art piece, that the only way that they could really create a piece of art that would reflect the community is if they went out and talked with people in the community. So they decided to do that, and they each had different block areas where you know, they did the interviews, um, went out and did it, and then what they ended up with um, is coming to the classroom and creating the art together. And uh, this was the result or the outcome of their project. It was, in t it was titled, Where Do You Live? A Presentation of Milwaukee as a Sum of Its Parts. And each one of the people in the poster art was one of the people that they had interviewed. And there was a quote from that, which you can't see in here, but too well here, you can see it a little bit. It was a quote from that particular indi individual from the interview. 
So as we think about high impact practices, you can see the thought that had to go into purposeful work that these students did. You can see that much of the work was done outside of the classroom. And you can see that the work helped students reflect on not only the process, not only the art itself, but the process of how one displays art in a public place. And certainly it helped them to reflect on their own community by conducting the interviews and listening to what participants had to say. Questions on this particular class? Yes. I'm just wondering how, how did they uh, get to the blend, like wonder and class Sorry. wonder? Like, how did they get to? How did they, um, how did they uh, define the blend, like uh, one third in class, one third out, and one third oh. online? Oh. That's, that's a question that um, so many people ask when they're designing um, their first blended course. Um, it really depends on what you're going to do in that class. And it's, I can't give you a textbook answer, um, but I think you have to take in consideration the length of the class, the time that the class meets, um, the number of people in the class, what you are trying to do in the way of learning activities, and then your own comfort level. Like, this was Amy's first hybrid class, and she really went out there and did it. I mean, most blended instructors, from my experience in working with them, don't start this big. But I think this is an idea she had, and she had been thinking about it for a long time, and this was a way for her to do it. But um, most instructors start with putting maybe 10% of their class online. Um, I personally generally put um, no more ever than half of my class online or outside of the classroom. That's what I feel comfortable with. That's what works for the topics that I teach. However, I will tell you that what I teach, I teach courses that most students don't like to take, theory and um, re qualitative, quantitative research. I try to make it fun. But um, in any case, most students, uh, for instance, quantitative research would be an example. You want to spend more time with students because they're not comfortable with the material. So I tend to spend more face-to-face -face time in those types of classes. That's a judgment call on what works well for me. I think everyone has to go through that planning process um, and decide what is going to be best for this group of students, for this class, and for their own teaching style. Does that? Yes. Did, did the community have uh, oops, sorry. Uh, did the community have input into their initial design after they had come up with it? They did. So in addition to the interviews, they did. They they went back to the to the individuals, and of course they had permission to do all of this, including the photos and quotes and so forth. But yes, they did get the feedback. It was really a quite a remarkable class all the way around. All right, we will move on. The second class, um, this topic is um, probably a sad one in some respects, um, in that this is, a, I think, a problem, a social problem that we face across the globe. Okay, how might we better understand the causes of homelessness and the services needed for the homeless? This was taught by um, Dr. Um, Lackey, who was a cultural, who is a cultural anthropologist. The title of the course, Nature of Cities, was a graduate level course, and enrollees were predominantly public service workers. There were 21 students enrolled in the class. And by the way, I'm going to um, break for a moment here and say that I understand that your classes many times are substantially larger like 50 to 150 and so forth. That also requires you to rethink it. The pedagogy stays the same, okay? But how you deliver it so that you survive and your students survive throughout the experience is a whole nother thing. Like, you know, for instance, let's take the art course that we were just talking about, okay? Suppose that course were, had 60 students in it. Well, then let's not do one art project, let's do a couple of art projects. Um, and let's make sure that a lot of the interaction and, and or a lot of the materials that need to be evaluated closely by the instructor maybe are done at a group level 
it's much easier to do, you know, six ratings than 60. So, I mean, that's the type of thinking. But the biggest thing about large lectures, and, and, and the thing that I think that's a challenge, at least it was for me, and in a talking to others, um, I've noticed the same, is being able to make it personable. I mean, what are you going to do to make it personable? And I will tell you that because you can interact with students online, one-to-one, -one, um, you can, this is a way to make it personable. Personable. I interviewed a guy in um, San Diego, a professor in San Diego, that taught a class of 500. That was the normal enrollment. It was a psych class. He put all of his lectures online. And all of his time in the classroom, he spent going over um, some of the critical, um, he put all of his lectures online and he had polling. And so students, he'd ask questions before students ever got to the, cl to the classroom. So he would know ahead of time what they got and what they didn't. And during the class, they would break up in small groups that were you know, pre-assigned and they would come up with, he'd give them cases and they'd have to come up with um, the con going over the concept until someone got it right. And then that group would have to explain to the rest of the class how it is that they came up with the solution. So, you know, it's, the pedagogy is the same, very interactive, but you have to think about how you're going to play it out. Okay, so back to nature of cities. Graduate level course, 21 enrolled in the class, 30% face-to-face, 40% community-based, and 30% online journaling and filming, preparing for the filming of the documentary, which actually happened at the conclusion of this course. So I'm just gonna give you a little intro. This is like a three minute clip. Um, and I am looking for a mouse and I just found it. Here we go. In the spring of 2008, 25 Marquette University students participated in a social experiment. The students were in a class called the Nature of Cities. Their instructor, Dr. Jill Florence Lackey, challenged her students to create and maintain a mock identity. The mock identities, they assumed, were that of full-time students working full-time jobs, paying them $7 an hour. Some students had a family to support. This was not simply a classroom simulation. It was a real community experience in which they needed to find housing, jobs, develop a budget, and pay their bills. At times, unexpected illnesses or expenses were challenges they had to overcome. By the end of the semester, five became homeless. Summarized in their own words, here is what they learned. At the beginning of the semester, you know, we all started off with similar situations and it was just very apparent very quickly how one or two um, positive or negative life chances could um, really impact a person's life who's living on or near the poverty line. Um, you know, making it apparent that there is a thin line between just making it and becoming homeless. And uh, participating in this experience really forced me to place myself in the shoes of someone else. Um, and although, as I said, my mock identity didn't become homeless and is seemingly in an okay position now, um, I, I struggled to pay her bills, um, to find education for her child, um, to file her service paperwork, to pay off her debts and what have you. And it just gave me a newfound respect for people who do this on a daily basis, especially someone who has to account for a child. Um, I myself don't have children, um, so I just you know, really uh, respect someone who is able to do this in their daily life. The fact of standing in line, waiting, appointments, and I don't know why social programs make you have appointments in the middle of the day, or you have appointments where you have to wait for two hours, um, and all the forms you have to fill out, and that's just really disheartening to sit there. And I mean, you, you feel like a cow in a line just waiting for the slaughter. We have just received one of those little garbage, uh, little um, grocery bags from the Boy Scouts asking to put money in it for um, food pantries. I normally throw those away or use them for garbage. This month I actually put food in it for other people. I never saw that side of the story where you know a single person with a bachelor's degree in this type of situation so I think I'm pretty glad that I went through this and uh, and again, I hope that in the future I can uh, volunteer my time more to help people that go through these situations. Uh, in real life, I now have more appreciation of single parents, uh, sticking to budgets. I've made donations to food pantries as a result of this, doing some research, volunteer work with my church, 
and I've learned about some of my church resources um, and where some of my tax dollars go for these programs. Okay, so you can see that um, at the conclusion of the course, uh, they were filming this documentary, this is part of the documentary, that um, the, the experience had really impacted these students in some um, profound way. The nature of the research study we did, um, the one that I referred to earlier, was to take a look at, after a period of time, whether or not people's behavior had changed. Um, because what good does it do if we teach these things, we go through, and there's a lot of logistics to set up, a lot of work in this type of course. I'm not going to say there isn't by any means. Um, great experience, but what if it just leaves them um, after they get out of the classroom? So three years later, we went back to them and we asked them, of all the classes that you took in your graduate work, can you name the top three classes that were most impactful to you? 54% of those that we interviewed identified this class as uh, one of the three most impactful classes they had taken. And 71% of those interviewed identified specific changes in their behavior as a result of taking the class. So in this particular instance, it, it did seem that, and we interviewed, by the way, almost, there were three people that we couldn't interview. They, didn't refu they were out of the area, two we couldn't find, but we interviewed most of the class. Um, and, and these were the results. Here's what they had to say. The experience made me think that anyone could become homeless versus just those individuals in a lower social economic class. And I, I found this very interesting because Jill Florence Lackey, the instructor, um, shared um, when she did this documentary and it was introduced to the community, I happened to go that evening, and she shared with us at the beginning, um, in her introdu introduction, that she was one step away from being homeless herself. And I'm sure that that may have interested her in the topic. And this was, by the way, after she had earned her PhD. So um, the point is that, you know, she, she, and this is the point that she was trying to instill in students, um, anyone can become homeless. Um, the experiment we did, like interviewing for the shelter, I mean, students actually had to, they were, had these mock identities, they went out, they interviewed with social institutions like the shelter for placement. Um, not having a stable home can change a person's life and having resources can help people. The class really allowed me to think about homelessness and how people became homeless. I have more empathy now. Um, all of these different social programs that you had to look up for yourself, um, if you could apply or be considered, it was a different way of thinking for this individual, something she had never experienced before. Okay, here's how they told us that their behavior changed. Um, one, this particular individual was um, a lieutenant in a uh, police force. I now teach officers to respect all classes of people in all neighborhoods. Uh, and she tended to look at um, the punishment fitting the crime. Um, another person actually did a volunteer program. And she said that many of people weren't aware of some of uh, the bigger social issues in Milwaukee. And the third said, you know, he was much more sensitive to programs that the city offers um, and uh, makes the remark that it's really tough when you're at a volunteering um, and you see uh, kids coming through that um, are, are homeless. So um, it appears that, again, um, this is a very impactful class for them. Uh, if we think again about impactful learning practices, um, it, this particular class fits those criteria. Questions before I move on to sustainable futures? Okay, this particular class is taught by Dr. Bob Pavlik. He is um, actually in education. He's very interested in environmental studies. And um, the challenge um, that he, he faces is how do we increase awareness of the importance of a sustainable lifestyles? I think as we look at this topic, 
more and more globally, it's becoming much more prevalent than um, what it once was. Um, but yet, he still finds in his classrooms that graduate students know very little about sustainability. So again, this was a graduate course. Um, the title of the course, Modules of Sustainability, 18 students enrolled, most students working for not-for-profit organizations. One third of the time spent um, taking visits, making visits to organizations that had implemented a model of sustainability. Um, one third class time discussing the readings that were assigned in the course, and one third online during which they posted reflections after they went to these particular sustainable, um, or, or visited one of these sites with the sustainability model. And then they needed to do a bold proposal, and that bold proposal was something that um, actually they did or wanted to do for the community that would help us live more sustainable, sustainably. And then they did a mini book for sustainability. So those were the activities uh, they were involved in. 80%, um, this is two years later, not three years like the other class, um, although I have some hypotheses, anecdotal hypotheses about why there's the difference in the percentage. And based on time, I'm not gonna go there. But 80% um, of those interviewed identified the class as one of the three most impactful classes they had taken. And 88% of those interviewed identi uh, identified specific changes in their behavior as a result of taking the class. I should say that the people in these classes, many of them at this point were no longer in the program. They had graduated and moved on. So we were locating them in, in the communities um, in which they lived. So um, the field trips, and I'm not going to go to these sites, but you can because you'll have the presentation. The, uh, they included um, Ur the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee, which is a place that really, really focuses on um, using natural materials for building architecture. The place is beautiful, actually. And then gardens, I mean, very much into growing things locally, vegetables, and also um, flowers and so forth. So, um, and then the Plymouth Institute, which is a, a think tank um, where individuals come together from different disciplines and design sustainable projects and do research on those designs. And then Four Corners um, Fair Trade Store, which is um, located in Milwaukee, but they also have an online um, shopping area where you can go in and buy things that were made um, that are environment, they were made um, with the environment in mind across the world. Um, so those are, that's just an example of three of the places. They also went to Johnson Controls, which is very big. It's a Fortune 500 company located in Milwaukee. Very big on um, environmentally friendly products. And their whole facility is um, powered by solar energy. Um, that's really uh, their headquarters. It's a pretty neat place to see. So those, that was the nature of their field trips. Um, the actions that they identified, here's a couple of actions that they identified in their bold proposals. Partner with environmental organizations to create a week-long experience for kids at an environmental camp. This person did that. Okay, so at the time, this was at the conclusion of the class, of course it wasn't done, but when we went back two years later, this person did that. Uh, volunteers compete in teams for a chance to win meaningful prizes, gifts for cleaning up the community. This person did that. Um, include sustainability courses as part of the mandor mandatory curriculum in schools from K-12. Um, create a program for student athletes focused on personal awareness, reflection, gratitude, um, sustainable issues. Um, the person uh, enrolled in the program was a um, pretty high level manager in the athletics program at um, Marquette and they actually implemented this program. So um, reported actions um, supporting sustainability, in other words, when we back, went back two years later and said, okay, were you able to complete this, uh, any work on this bold proposal? Well, here's the guy who was cleaning up the community and you can tell he was really measuring these things because they did have a competition um, and they were giving prizes. The one on cigarette box really threw me. I thought, oh. <laughs> but uh, he's a delightful guy and uh, just very, um, 
good sense of humor and all that, but he involved, and this, I, to me, this would be a great project for a big class. I mean, where you can really have a lot of fun and do something for the community and, and still learn uh, about the environment. Um, reported, more reported, so, I'm, so now I'm trying to start a collaboration with urban ecology, um, and so you know, she's talking about how um, they could do community services together and um, form some partnerships. And then uh, the third person, a very practical example, I'm more aware of what I do each day, even with buying things. So instead of buying a new dryer, he took it apart and figured out that it was just a $20 fuse. Um, and so these are actions that they reported that were um, a result of their thinking more about sustainability as related to this course. So before I go on to the leadership course, any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, as a teacher, most of the challenges we face so far is, for example, how to get like a, a room with a screen at the U of O. So I just wonder, how do we do that? Get, a, mean, get a room with a screen? Yes. I mean, you mean like, like this? Yeah. No, I'm being, I'm being slightly sarcastic, but it's just like, it sounds wonderful. It's just like using universities are ready to do a project like this. So uh, you're talking about not having maybe all of the rooms, the technology, technology yeah, you need in the like rooms. The politics to support such, you know, like in terms of responsibility, like. I th it's my understanding that the university is putting forward a lot more technology to help you all to be able to do these kinds of courses. But I was just sharing with David before we started, I can remember the days, I'm really dating myself here, where I'd be pulling carts out of closets with you know, slide projectors and all of that. And it wasn't all that long ago, so it's a progression. Um, I would, if, if you're facing that um, situation, I would start small with things that are stable. Um, I want to share with you um, one thing that I found out with interviews, and this is in, in, in the text I wrote. Um, when I interviewed 15 very experienced uh, hybrid teachers, by that they taught 20 plus hybrid courses, I could not find one of them that used more than five different technologies. And I'm, I don't use more than five technologies. And I'm going to share with you why I don't do that. Um, I look for very, very stable technologies. So to your point, you know, you, you want to find something that's, that's very, when you do have it available, something that's very stable. And I want to stick with it. So I want it to be on the market for a long time because every time I have to learn a technology, that's time that I'm taking away from keeping up with my discipline. And that's very, I mean, you know, I, I just don't, I, I'm sure you're the same, you don't have that kind of time. So, you know, it's got to work, it's got to be parsimonious, and it has got to be something that's going to be around for a while. Course management systems are generally that. Yes? First of all, I thank you. I, this is so relevant and exciting. It takes me back to 1975, 78, in, uh, at the Confitute Institute at uh, in Connecticut, at the University of Connecticut. I was there for training back then on uh, the pedagogy for the gifted. It's still there. And what stands out in what you're sharing with us, beyond the online and the presential, is the authenticity of what we ask the students to do. And uh, I just so happened to have a student that was there back then. It's that purposeful work. That's right. So I think this is what I'm uh, keeping, and I want to well, humbly highlight here, is way beyond the technology is the purpose of the long <coughs> tasks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's so true. Anyone else behind you? Judy King, I'm a physiotherapist and I teach in physiotherapy here. I'm just wondering from the first three cases, if you also looked at just the concept or asked the participants whether it was just the community aspect and had really nothing to do with the online part of the courses. As a physiotherapist, and I'm here with my colleagues in the other health sciences, 
all our courses and our curriculum is designed that we have didactic parts, problem-based learning or case stuff online, but as well we have an apprenticeship or mentorship model. We all have clinical practice for our students. So I'm just wondering if you were able to tease out the differences of the concepts of how they enjoyed the course because it was actually with real people <laughs> and how much of it was the online part. Thanks. I have many, many examples, and I, unfortunately, well, I could bring them up on, because my course evaluations are online, um, where, where students speak to the online portion of the class and say things like, I never thought I would get into the depth of discussion that I got into in this online situation. So I think they do value the online part, but they can in a moment see through it if it is not purposeful work. So you really, really have to prime them by telling them, and here's why we're going to do this, um, so that they can see the relationship, because you see the relationship, because you know the whole layout of the course, but they don't. You know, So you have to make that relevant to them so that they can understand it. Um, I think for me personally as a teacher, one of the things that hybrid does so well is it, it forces that interaction with material before you get into the classroom so that when you get into the classroom, students are really prepared to discuss whatever the reading you assigned, the case analysis you might have assigned, and so forth. Um, I had um, a quote in the beginning of one of my chapters in the book, I think it was chapter 12, as I recall, were, um, I, because I thought this was so relevant, um, and this was um, the CIO from Harvard, actually, that I interviewed, and he said, you know, when you get student, when you get a group together in a classroom and you take their time, it better be so transformative that it, it, it couldn't happen any other way unless you had these group of people face to face. And the point that he's making is, you know, blended can help you get people to that point of making that short amount of classroom time together very, very meaningful. Um, I don't know if that addresses your question. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I, when we did this research, okay, remember we asked the question, um, which what three classes impacted you the most? Well, surprisingly enough, and I, I truly was surprised, and I, I didn't even recognize it in the interviewing process until I was um, doing the statistics, um, the descriptive statistics um, for the study. Um, interestingly enough, who would think that a theories course came in number two? Um, and I, I happened to teach this class, and so that's why I bring it forward today. And so then I was very curious about why students would identify a theories class as being so relevant um, to them that, that they actually, by the way, the sustainability class was number one. Um, and, and so this leadership theories class came in um, as number two. And when I teach this class, and, and as I said, I teach classes that oftentimes <laughs> um, the content is Flat. I mean, qualitative research, quantitative research theory. Um, I don't view it as that. I, I really get jazzed about it. But um, so, so my challenge is: How do I make leadership theory real and relevant? All through the course, I'm asking myself: How do I make every time I teach it? And I've taught this class a lot. Okay. Title of the course: History, Theory of Leadership and Ethics, Graduate Level Course. It's a required course for earning a graduate degree. It's a Master of Arts in Leadership Studies. Enrollments of about, we cap at 20. Sometimes there's 30. I mean, you know, but it, it ranges between 20 and 30. 60% of the time spent face-to-face, 10% -face, um, community-based, and 30% online predominantly discussion of the readings, case studies, and self-assessments. So that's pretty much how um, the class is, is laid out. And so when I saw how many classes, or how many individuals identified this as, um, as an important or impactful class, I asked why, okay? And um, to your point, by the way, because you just asked me the question, is it engaging in, you know, with the community? Um, they, they most identified this leadership panel discussion. 
okay, which is what I call um, the integrative learning experience for this particular course, okay? So at the end of the course, they do this. Okay, and the purpose is to identify whether practicing leaders behave in ways that reflect leadership theory and ethical behavior. So all through the course, we're studying leadership theory, ethical behavior in the form of personal self-assessments, case studies, readings, okay? So now it's like, okay, so invite, I use small groups, each small group find a community leader, invite that community, who you think is a good leader, okay, invite that leader in for a 90 minute panel discussion. And our panels have ranged anywhere from four to seven. Um, and ask them questions that are based on what you've learned in texts about leadership this semester and see if how they respond is relevant to what we've studied and read. Okay, so that basically is the project. And they do the entire logistics for this course, they decide, for this project. They invite the people, they send them uh, a letter of invitation, they arrange for the parking, um, they figure out whether there's going to be an MC or if they're going to split those duties up, who's going to introduce, all of that is up to them. I tell them I will do nothing other than thank the um, panelists for their volunteerism toward Marquette University. Okay, and we videotape um, these sessions. Okay, and they also, of course, develop the questions. They develop the questions online in their small groups. Then during a class, face-to-face -face class session, I, in the interim, put all of the questions in one file. We put them up and we wordsmith them and we pull out. We delete, we color code, here's the ones we don't want, and we end up with about 12 questions. And we have never gotten through all of those 12 questions in a 90-minute panel discussion. So I always ask them um, to be sure that they indicate which questions they really want to get at, and they may have to skip a few to get, um, to get the questions that they really want in answered. Okay, um, and so uh, let me just bring up an example of the last set of questions, just to give you an idea. Um, this was the final product of what they had developed. So um, very please describe your leadership style. Of course, what I've asked them to do is don't ask anyone if they practice contingency theory of leadership, because they're not gonna know what you're talking about, because most of these individuals have not studied leadership in any formal way. Or don't ask them about you know um, authentic leadership and so forth. Um, but put these questions in a way that you can get the answer by using just uh, language that is going to be understandable to a general audience. So can you describe um, your motivation to lead? And so forth. So this is the set of questions they came up with. Um, it, very interesting question four really comes right smack out of the largest leadership study that has ever been conducted, the Global Studies in Leadership. They were published in 2010, I believe. Um, in which the chapter on U.S. leadership is, is um, titled um, Leader as Hero, because in the U.S. we still are in that framework. In fact, I'm doing a content analysis right now, and, um, and I suspect that I am going to very much see that Leader as Hero is still very much the framework, even though we're preaching participatory leadership. Um, and flat organizations. But it takes a while to ad adapt to um, what you're talking about, right? T it takes time for that to act actually go into practice. So, you know, here's the set of questions that uh, they developed, and I can um, close out on this, um, and I can go back to where we were, which is close to the end here. Um, And take you. Um, we we actually um, list these individuals partly clearly as marketing, but also partly as in gratitude for their um, volunteerism. So these are the types of leaders that have volunteered. I mean, we've had mayors, polit and, and politicians, police chiefs, um, CEOs from organizations um, coming in, some educators. 
Um, we, we tend to put short clips of this online. Here's, um, here's a short clip. I'm not going to play this all, but you, you'll just get um, an idea of how this is set up. And again, um, we, we're lucky. Here was the question, what do you believe is essential to be in an effective I think to leader? be a good leader, you have to be a good listener. Because you're trying to get people to move in a direction. And if you don't know what the stumbling blocks are that keep them from going in that direction, then you can't help them overcome them. So Kathleen Falk actually ran for, um, for governor and lost. She challenged our um, current governor, um, Tommy, um, and uh, lost that election. But nonetheless, this was a, this was a couple, um, probably about three or four months before the election. So um, I think that one of the reasons that the, that students, based on what they told me, identified this class as most impactful is this particular experience. However, the whole class content, the activities lead up to this experience. So I think that may be um, a way of looking at it. So then, in conclusion, and we are a little bit over here, what you want to think about is, you know, begin with the question, how might a blended course help you better engage students in learning? And then in terms of high impact educational practice, brainstorm, what are the possibilities? Uh, be creative in how you engage students in achieving learning outcomes and practice good mentorship. I don't know if you caught the article uh, about mid-May in um, the Chronicle of Higher Ed that I, I forget the exact title, but the, but the message was they had polled thousands of students and a polling service had polled thousands of students and came to the conclusion that students were more impressed by professors that cared about them um, than um, the ranking of the college or university that they were attending. And you know, isn't that true of all of us? We want to feel valued. Um, so you know, students want to know that you care about them and their success. Uh, provide them with guidance and frequent feedback and have fun with students. Students are fun. And laugh at yourself often because if you're like me, I don't do everything right. And if I can't laugh about it, I'm going to fret about it. And what fun is that? And so that's all I have for you today. And I would invite you to bring forward any comments or questions you might have.